You may notice in the Bible that Joshua keeps showing up. Our text this morning is going to be drawn from 2 Kings chapter 2. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us this morning. We pray that you'd open your word to us, and by the power of the Spirit, you'd cause us to see it, understand it, and do it. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was a young man, between childhood and adulthood, I felt that I was living in a very boring time. The upheaval of the 1960s with the Vietnam War made the late 1970s and 1980s feel uneventful. Disco, platform shoes, but then the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union collapsed. The Gulf War occurred, which were the opening salvos in an immense struggle between Islam and the West. In fact, the days in which I had lived were times between great events. This morning we'll see that great events in the Bible are tied to great characters of the Bible and are often in between as we look at Joshua between Joshua's. Joshua between Joshua's. This morning in 2 Kings we'll see Joshua in the background and then we'll see Joshua in the foreground. So first of all, Joshua in the background. Go ahead and open up your Bibles in the Old Testament to 2 Kings chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And it says there in verse 1, Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. And Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Now you may remember a couple weeks ago, we looked at another section of First Kings. We saw these two beginning to work together. We saw Elijah, who had done these great works on Mount Carmel by the power of God, then becomes filled with fear and flees before his enemies, goes up to Mount Sinai, and God meets with him there. And God tells him that he's going to have an assistant now. He's going to have a successor and an apprentice named Elisha. And we saw Elisha leaving his home and going with Elijah. Now here we find the two of them at Gilgal. Gilgal. You will see Gilgal is a place that has a heavy shadow upon it from Joshua. For it's at Gilgal where Joshua crossed the Jordan River in conquest into the land. The priests of God in the days of Joshua, carrying the Ark of the Covenant, come down to the River Jordan. And when their feet touch the river, it splits in two, just like the Red Sea, and they pass over in conquest into the land of promise. They take 12 stones from the middle of that river, representing the 12 tribes, and they go to their place of camp that night, which is at Gilgal, and they set up a memorial of those stones there. Gilgal, associated with Joshua. And so they go now from Gilgal, Elijah and Elisha, and head down to Beth-El. Beth-El, Bet house of El, house of God. And here is Jeroboam's golden calf. Now you may remember when the northern kingdom split off from the southern kingdom of Israel, that they set up a shrine, two of them, two separate little temples, in order to compete with Jerusalem. And one of them was at Beth-El, and there was a golden calf at Beth-El. It was a center of heresy. It was a place where you wouldn't expect to find righteousness, and yet we're told here, the prophets are there. Now notice the conversation between Elijah and Elisha. Elijah says, stay here at Gilgal. But Elisha says, no, I'm going with you. I'm going with you, and they head down to Bethel. Keep that in mind. Stay here. I'm going with you. Going on to verse 4. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Do you see the conversations occurred a second time? You stay here at Bethel. I'm going down to Jericho. And Elisha says, no, I'm coming with you. Second time the conversation occurs, and now they wind up at 
Jericho. Again, the shadow of Joshua lies heavy on this place. Jericho was the first city conquered by the people of Israel when they came in conquest into the land in the days of Joshua. It was supposed to never be rebuilt, and yet it was. And what do we find here at Jericho? We find the prophets are here. The prophets are here. Going on to verse 6, Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, and they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted from one side to the other till the two of them could go over on dry ground. Third time the conversation happens. Elisha, you stay here. You stay here. I'm going on to Jericho. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm going on to the Jordan. You stay here at Jericho. I'm going on. And Elisha says, no, I'm coming with you. Three times, and you'll notice in this text, that conversation now comes to an end. Three times this conversation occurs. And when you see threes like that, you should be looking for death and resurrection. You should be looking for something old coming to an end and something new coming into the foreground. And here we find the Joshua, Joshua theme again at the Jordan River. They've gone now from Jericho down to the Jordan. And look what he does. He does the same thing that Joshua did, right? except it's a little different this time. Instead of the priests coming forth, carrying the Ark of the Covenant, coming into the land, rather we see that Elijah takes his cloak and taps the water and it parts and they exit out of the land. Elijah parts the Jordan and they head out to the western shore. They head out from the western shore over to the eastern shore. They're heading out of the land, and they would turn around now and look back into the land at the very spot that Joshua stood as he was looking into the land, as Moses was dying, and now the people of God are going to come into conquest into the promised land. Verse 9, when they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. If you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be done for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be done so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, the chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind up into heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Now, there's more parallels here. You may remember when the first Joshua began his ministry, he's standing on the far shore looking into the land. Moses has parted. Moses dies, does not come into the land, and hands off his ministry, his leadership, to Joshua. And do you notice here that Elijah does something similar? Elijah now acts like a new Moses, handing off his ministry to a new Joshua, Elisha. If you think I'm a little off base on this, think about these parallels for a minute. Elijah, mysteriously taken into heaven, experiencing some sort of translation or death, as it were, and remember Moses, when he died, his body was hidden by God. It was clouded in mystery. And now to bring everything to full circle, remember on another mountain, on the Mount of Transfiguration in the New Testament, who shows up and meets with Jesus? Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses. The old prophet must be taken out of the way so that the new prophet can come to the fore, so that a new Joshua can come into the foreground. I stayed at a friend's house, which was on a hill above a freeway. The freeway itself was in a depression in a small valley below, so that you knew it was there because you could hear the cars in the background, but you couldn't see them or the freeway at all. Elijah and his great ministry has been unpacking itself in First and Second Kings, and Elisha, the new Joshua, though you know he's there, has been in the background. Now he will come into the foreground. Kids, listen up. We see Joshua in the background. Now we're going to see Joshua in the foreground. Let's continue on. Joshua in the foreground. Look at the second part of verse 12 here in 2 Kings chapter 2. 
So Elijah's taken up chariots of fire. And then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he struck the water, the water parted from one side to the other, and Elisha went over. Now think about this for a minute. They went out of the land. The river parted. The river came back together. They're standing on the far shore looking into the promised land. And then the chariots of fire come and sweep Elijah away. He drops his cloak to the ground. And Elisha takes his garments and tears them in two. Elijah takes his old garments and removes them. And he's got a new garment. It's the mantle, the cloak of Elijah. He's subsuming his ministry. And now, like a new Joshua, standing on the eastern shore, he taps the water and it parts just like the original Joshua did. And now he's coming into the land like a new Joshua. The first Joshua saw the river parted via the Ark of the Covenant. But notice this new Joshua, a Joshua in between, a Joshua in between, like the final Joshua, is the Ark. We see that the presence of God is with Elisha. It's not about his cloak. It's about Elisha himself having the spirit of God coming upon him and the river parts. Going on to verse 15. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. And they said to him, Behold, there are with your servants 50 strong men. Please let them go and seek your master. It may be that the spirit of the Lord has caught him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, you shall not send. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send. They sent therefore 50 men. And for three days they sought him, but did not find him. And they came back to him while he was staying at Jericho. And he said to them, Did I not say to you, do not go? Once again, we got threes here. Isn't that fascinating? Three times the conversation occurs, and then something happens. We see the old prophet taken out of the way. We see the old prophet die, as it were. We see a new prophet rise up, a new prophet resurrect, as it were, in that office. And now we've got three days. Three days going for the missing Elijah. Where is Elijah? The sons of the prophets look in valleys. They look on mountaintops. They cannot find him. Three days, but no resurrection for the old prophet. He's truly gone. But in some sense, there is. For there's a resurrection for the prophecy. And a new prophet arises and resurrects from the old Elijah. Now becomes Elisha in his ministry. Going on to verse 19. Now the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, the situation of the city is pleasant. As my Lord sees, but the water is bad, and the land is unfruitful. He said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. This Joshua between, this New Joshua goes first to Jericho to bring blessings. And notice what happens here. We see that he acts like the old Joshua. We see that he's forecasting the new Joshua. The Joshua between makes the bad water good. The Joshua between makes the bad water good. He makes it fresh water. He makes it streams of living water. And what happens when the final Joshua comes? Kids, do you know who the final Joshua is? Joshua is a Hebrew name, and when it's translated into Greek, it's Jesus. Jesus. The Joshua between makes bad water good. The final Joshua will be streams of living water. He will be a spring of living water. Coming forth from the final Joshua will be streams of living water, bringing life everywhere it goes, bringing life to the nations, bringing life to the cosmos, reversing the curse, but there's more. The Joshua between makes bad water good. The final Joshua will turn water into wine. Can I hear an amen to that? The feast will be on with the final Joshua. 
and the conquest of the world. Verse 23. Now we got a weird story. Kids, you got to pay attention. This is a weird story. He went up from there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out. Now notice how he's retracing his steps. He's going in reverse of what Elijah did with him. Some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. From there, he went on to Mount Carmel, and from there, he returned to Samaria. Now, by the way, probably this isn't little boys here. This can also be translated young men. They're a bunch of hoodlums of some sort. And they're saying here, go up, you bald head. They're using the word alach, which means to ascend. It's a similar word to the ascension offering. Go up, you bald head. Ascend up. Ascend up, you bald head. It's quite possible that since he tore his garments, he might have pulled his hair out as well. It wasn't uncommon to tear your garments in mourning and then to shave your head, but it may be something else too. It could also be an idiom that we don't understand here. Ascend up, you bald head, could also mean, where's your hairy-headed one? Elijah had lots of hair. He looked like a wild man. We know that from the accounts of him because John the Baptist shows up looking exactly like him, a wild, hairy man. This could also be translated, where's your hairy-headed one? Where's your hairy-headed one? Peter Lightheart thinks they're actually priests from the city of the Golden Calves, and that would make a lot of sense with what's going on here. But as Elisha gives the curse, we see two she-bears come out of the woods, likely Syrian brown bears. These are relatives of the grizzly bear in America. Enraged she-bears arise for Elisha to protect him as though he were one of their own cubs. Now you notice in the Bible, the righteous rise in conquest over bears, but the wicked are conquered by bears. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, we read this, But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it from out of his mouth. But here we see the wicked are conquered by bears. The wicked have judgment and curses brought on them by bears. Why? You don't mess with Joshua when he's cleansing the land. You don't mess with Joshua when he's cleansing the land. And this new Joshua, this Joshua in between, is forecasting the cleansing of the land by the final Joshua, Jesus who will come and cleanse the land of demons, cleanse the land of unrighteousness, and then he will die, resurrect, and ascend to the right hand of the Father. And there by the power of the Spirit, he will cleanse the land that is the world, and you and I are part of those who are cleansed? and now are engaging in the cleansing. He cleansed Israel, now he's cleansing the world by the body of Christ, and that is you and I. There was a fighter at our old judo club who was definitely in the foreground of the best athletes on the West Coast. He was fast and very technically skilled, and I've never thrown him. And the last time we sparred, he was up under me, and before I knew it, I was flying through the air and crashing to the mat with a huge wham. You don't mess with him when he's doing his thing. Elisha, the new Joshua, moved from the background to the foreground after Elijah's departure. And what the young hoodlums of Bethel learned the hard way was, you don't mess with Joshua when he's doing his thing. And the thing he's setting the stage for is for the final Joshua, Jesus, the divine, matchless prophet, priest, and king. This morning... We've seen in 2 Kings, Joshua in the background, Joshua in the foreground, as we looked at Joshua between Joshua's. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in your unpacking of your covenant promises, of your types and shadows in the old covenant, pointing forward to the final coming of Messiah, your son, the final Joshua. We thank you that he has come, that he has died and resurrected and is seated at your right hand, and that he is now moving through the body of Christ even this morning. Bless us by the power of the Spirit to be hands and feet for the great King Joshua. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.